Oh, you're, should, do you want to skip? Yeah. Should we skip? Yeah. Do you want to go to after being? I'd go to that. Uh, in in Britain, yeah. This one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. In Britain, we have a section of our newsprint which defines itself as populist. These papers are usually aimed at the working class, such as the Sun, but seem to oppose and present opinions and create belief systems that are counterproductive to the interests of their main readership. With, with such control of the informational environment of this section of the population, how can they break free from the influences that their social circumstances affords them? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you probably know better than I do, but if you go back not many years to the 1960s, uh, these tabloids were left-wing papers. Uh, their change reflects a change in Britain. Uh, similar things happened in the U.S. The New York Post, which is a tabloid and is now maybe kind of so far to the right, you need a telescope to find it. When I was a kid, it was a kind of a leftish, social democratic paper. In fact, in England, the... Uh, uh, the most widely read newspaper until the early 1960s was the Daily Herald, which was working class based social democrat. Hey. Sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> nice music. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, uh, I think had broader, it had a broader circulation than most of the major newspapers combined. So it was a popular kind of slightly leftish newspaper, um, a lot of reader support and so on, and it made a difference. It went out of business, I think, in the mid-60s because it couldn't compete with uh, capital concentration and advertiser reliance. What has pretty much destroyed the free press, there used to be a very lively free press in England and the United States uh, in the 19th century, probably its peak, uh, kind of declined since, uh, and it, it's largely an effect of capital concentration and advertiser reliance, which an independent press isn't going to be able to compete with. So yes, there's been, there's been a change, and your question is quite appropriate. How do you reach people when uh, uh, the press is uh, uh, imposing on them a doctrinal system which uh, is contrary to their interests and concerns? And that's a, a question which hasn't been investigated much, unfortunately. And it's an interesting one, but it does show up in strange ways. Now, I don't know about England, but in the United States, uh, there's very intensive study of popular attitudes. That's primarily because it's a business-run society, and business wants to keep its finger on public pulse. That's how you know how to control people and so on. So we have a ton of information about U.S. attitudes. Now, the press is divided between... You know, kind of like Fox News, you know, sort of like the Sun, uh, which is owned by the same corporation, actually. Yeah, I think so. It's you know jingoist, extremist, racist, everything else, and that reaches a mass audience. On the other hand, you have the what's called the liberal press, aimed at liberal intellectuals, New York Times, you know, Washington Post, Boston Globe, and so on. But they give a totally distorted picture of what's happening. Like on this issue, everything I was just saying before would be unknown to readers of the uh, mainstream liberal press, because it's all suppressed. As I said, they rarely deviate much from a kind of a party line. Now, they can give criticisms on the fringe, but uh, not fundamental criticisms. Like, like take, say, the Iraq war. Uh, Obama is hailed by the uh, liberal intellectual establishment for having taken a principled opposite being a principled stand against the war from the beginning well he did take a principled stand by the standards of the intellectual community maybe he took approximately the stand that uh, the nazi generals took after stalingrad uh, when they said a two-front war is a strategic error you know should have done it well, that's what obama said he said the invasion of iraq is a strategic blunder uh, you could read that in Pravda in the early 1980s, you know, critics of the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. We don't call that a principled stand in the case of others. Uh, we call it the pure cynicism. But in our own case, 
that's a principled stand because that's as far as you're allowed to go. You can't say, you know, it's a war crime. I mean, the same thing came up with the torture memos recently. You know, there were a couple of new things in them, which were incidentally mostly suppressed by the press. About the only new thing that came out of any interest was that uh, uh, Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, and the rest were Rumsfeld were pressing very hard for U.S. intelligence to elicit uh, confessions that would uh, link Iraq to Al Qaeda. They couldn't get the evidence, and the interrogators said, "Look, we just, there isn't any evidence. We can't do it." And that's where the torture comes from. So they were demanding that they torture in order to get the evidence that the government needed in order to invade Iraq. Well, that's about the only interesting thing in the whole, uh, in, in all the revelations. It was never reported in the New York Times or the Washington Post. It was reported in the, the McClatchy Press, a small, smaller but quite good uh, news press. Uh, but and then then comes the surprise. You know, you read the liberal commentators. In fact, the strongest opponents of. Bush, really critical ones and very good ones like Paul Krugman or uh, Jane Mayer, who did some of the main exposure of the Guantanamo torture. And their reaction to it is, you know, we've lost our way. You know, look what this Bush administration did to us. You know, it's uh, uh, we always were a noble, idealistic country. And look what they've done. Really? Uh, when we were a noble, idealistic country, like uh, when the English colonists came over and we were a city on the hill. That's what's the usual phrase. Uh, take a look at that phrase. The U.S. was de- uh, colonies were declared a city on the hill by John Winthrop, the English colonist, in 1630. We we're going to be a city on the hill. Uh, a year before that, 1629, his colony, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, put out what's called the Great Seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You can find it on the, the internet. The Native American fellow with uh, something out of his mouth, uh, we need your help or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, it said, "Come." it was an Indian pleading, right. come over and help us. Yeah. Uh, that's the first example of what's now called humanitarian intervention. Uh, very much loved by the British intellectual classes. Right. And it's a pretty typical example. So the colon, John Winthrop City on the Hill was per- perfectly benign. You know, in fact, they were just answering the plea of these miserable pagans to come over and help them. Well, they came over and helped them. They even helped them get to heaven pretty quickly because they exterminated <laughs> them. You know? So that's the city on the hill from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And it just continues. There's no point running through the history. But... Uh, Somehow, uh, the torture memos show we've lost our way. Now, it's true that in the last 50 years or so, there's been a shift. Uh, um, the CIA in the early 50s did begin to develop new techniques of torture based on the KGB and the Gestapo, who had discovered that the most efficient means of torture are um, essentially psychological, the kind that don't leave marks on the body but that turn people into vegetables, like sensory deprivation. Actually, what you saw in Abu Ghraib, that's mostly mental torture, it's called. Uh, what is not reported in the press is that when the U.S. signed the torture convention, first you know, Reagan signed it, Clinton had it ratified, it excluded CIA torture. So it modified the International Torture Convention to drop the references to mental torture. That is exactly the kind we do, uh, usually done by clients, you know, like Saigon Army or the Salvadoran torturers or something like that. Uh, so basically, so, so the U.S., you could argue that the Bush administration isn't violating the torture convention as the U.S. interpreted it. It's a little different from its predecessors in that so much was done by U.S. armed personnel Usually, torture is farmed out to clients. Uh, so, okay, a little different, but and almost all of it is still carried out by clients. As far as we know, the Obama administration is continuing.